Bismillah. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to thank you for, for coming, uh, the MSA. Now, uh, one of the many um, challenges I've faced is people always insist on uh, calling me sheikh or addressing me sheikh, usually because of, our, of, of respect for it and be respectful, and I appreciate that. However, I don't really deserve the title for um, very obvious reasons, but one of the obvious reasons that I don't deserve the title is because I don't think someone should be called sheikh for pointing out the obvious. <laughs> and for pointing out facts which um, are not ones concerned with advanced fiqh or evidences. Reason being is, I believe that most Muslims have enough, enough observation of the world, they have all these dots in their head, they just don't connect the dots. And I suppose I am a over-glorified dot connector. And that's pretty much what I do. Uh, that's pretty much what I see I do. I mean, occasionally um, I do research, but the research is really about uh, the, <laughs> the reality that we live in. So I would point to history. I would point to, uh, that's okay, sister, the exceptionally squeaky door. <laughs> Brother, please come in and, and, uh, and relax. So it's uh, university doors. So. Um, in essence, so going back to dot connecting, um, all I really do is I, I connect dots and I might point out or, or research facts about history, about sociology, uh, about psychology that just re-emphasizes the Islamic beliefs that you already hold. And so hence, I, I, mean, I don't think you could be called a sheikh for, let's say, studying the physical sciences or studying um, history or sociology per se unless you're, you're a sheikh of that subject, <laughs> but that's in essence what I do. So, so let's think about it. I mean, definition of culture, I think the sheikh also kind of asked that question of you, what do you think culture is? And most people would generally say, I'm going to use this now, that's the teacher now, so. <laughs> no talking on my back is <laughs> Feels good saying that. So, all right, so culture, what is culture and why do we use this term? Well, generally people, when they refer to culture, they refer to four things. They refer to practices. So if a practice happens to be in one particular locale, people are known for that kind of practice, like for example, in England, they're known for the practice of queuing and being very patient in queuing. In New York, they have queuing, but they're not very patient in the queue. Uh, so they have, so there's certain practices. Then you have communication. So that would be language, or also communicating respect. How do you show respect? In Japan, it's bowing, obviously in in uh, Muslim lands, you wouldn't be bowing or, or, to, or to God unless you're um, connected with the ruling family or, or dynasties. Then those people seem to like bowing to uh, other gods. Um, then you have objects. Which objects which are connected to people's practices or culture. They might be, for example, a style of clothing. Uh, generally speaking, other objects might be, for example, well, in India, it would be a cultural artifact, uh, so to speak, to, look, to, uh, to refer to the stone idols that they pray to, for example. That would be a cultural artifact of uh, certain peoples that live in the Indus Valley. And this is why historians will refer to these things when they uncover it and dig up, uh, let's say, stone statues of people's old gods. They would refer to that as cultural artifacts. So, objects, and of course, lastly, and very importantly, beliefs. So people, and the beliefs can, can mean a whole number of things. It could be basically what that culture believes is good or bad. It could also be uh, what that culture believes is but, well, that's, 
suppose it's connected to good and bad. So what is a good way of forming families? Uh, is it, can you have, uh, is marriage a good thing? Is polygamy a good thing? Is it mon monogamy a good thing? So good and bad, very important. All the beliefs that are connected to culture might be what you, what you I suppose you call a world view, which is they might believe in particular uh, gods or a god or a creation myth or, uh, or any kind of understanding of how they came to be. This would be their world view. Now, the thing is this. Objects, objects here... So is it cultural that, let's say, people have a vase? Uh, vases, are, people uncover you know, archaeological digs and they find vases from ancient Greeks, and find vases from ancient Romans, and they find vases in ancient China, and they find vases in, in Islamic civilization. Is a vase, or, sorry, or, or is, is, it, is vases connected to particular beliefs or worldviews? No, it just happens to be objects that people use for utility. So we all, we find that, there are what I call universal aspects uh, where, where cold objects that are connected to universal utility, such as water carrying devices, for example, which is phases. Right. Right. So are not really connected to people's beliefs per se. They're not connected to a person's beliefs. So you can you can have a vase and be an atheist, a vase and be a Christian, a vase and be a Muslim. You can own a car and you don't have to be an atheist to own a car or a Christian to own a car or a Muslim to own a car. These are objects that are connected to uh, universal, universal desires. So, what are universal desires? Well, desires basically um, to, to, to go on, on transportation, to carry water, so on, to live. So, Here's the thing, when you look at this in terms of culture, people think that culture is one thing, and religion is something else. Now, with the exception of aspects of objects that are connected to universal things, and objects that are connected to uh, so say cultural objects, Objects that are universal and ones that are cultural, like stone statues, or um, let's say a, a, a masjid, or a church, or a synagogue, these are built objects that are connected to a worldview and a religion. What do you notice? Can anyone tell me what the difference then between a religion and culture is? What do you think is the difference between religion and culture? So, uh, sorry. I was going to say, so religion can be used as a justifier. Right, so used as a justifier of certain cultural traits. But isn't that, isn't that beliefs though? Isn't that one of the beliefs? Yeah, but there can be certain beliefs that go against a particular religion, so that religion acts as a filter for it. Well, so there, might, yes, yes, there might be, there might be, there might be um, beliefs that go against a particular religion, but surely then, oh, sorry, you might, be, you might be in cultures that go against a particular religion, yes. But that would be a separate culture. Or could you not argue it's a separate culture? So two cultures can contradict each other, yes? Have different practices, different beliefs, and worldviews. But what is the difference between a religion and culture as a, as a, as a, as a, as a category? Anyone would like to? What's the difference between religion and culture? Anyone like to venture? You, sister? The culture is according to the norms people are living. Yeah. It can have different religions in there. So you can't say this culture has this religion. I mean, religion is separate. I think religion is a separate thing from the culture, though it is. It does affect your culture. It does affect your culture. But I can be a Muslim, just like a Muslim. Doesn't matter. Culture, I'm not going to care too much, but I do care about the religion. Well, you're talking about, you're kind of, you really assumed a premise which is that culture and religion are separate, but I'm asking what makes culture and religion separate in the first place? Religion, religion is an ideology, right? So, it, it, so like, say there's a certain... But culture also can have ideology. 
One is divine, one isn't. Well, a culture can believe that it is it is a, the divine way of, of living. I mean, you, you had a question? Religion can be like a filter for many of those things, like telling you what is acceptable and what's not. But, but culture has been that. But, but that the answer is actually really obvious. And hence, and hence, most people don't get it. <laughs> That's the, which is the human condition. Sister has a hand up. Um, can religion be a culture in itself? I, basically, I think she's, she's basically said it. There really is no difference between religion and culture. As um, prior to secularism, there was no understanding of a separation between religion and culture. Everyone has always assumed that. And to be fair, um, in, in common parlance, we use it, I use it, I say religion, culture, so Muslims are doing cultural practice and they're not following a religious practice. We use it, and of course, uh, that's the purpose of our discussion today with religion and culture. But you see, the thing is this, um, the Arabic language and the words in the Quran and Sunnah haven't been secularized yet, haven't been taken out or removed or changed because you can't. So it retains a really interesting word which better fits these uh, discussions, and it's called deen. Right? A deen. What is a deen? That right? comes from, uh, it has two applications, and which are both um, complementary and both true at the same time, which is a deen is both beliefs and it is both a way of life, practices and a way, a way of life and beliefs, aqidah and amal and mu'amilat and all these other things, actions, transactions. And see, when I said uh, with communication, and this also links to what is good and bad communication, we have concepts such as showing respect, right? And also showing insult. Uh, we have also um, what you expect from people, which is in terms of rights, and obligations. So if I say salam alaikum to you, and as in, uh, in as an individual capacity, and you say and you don't say walaikum salam, even though you acknowledge that I've said it to you, this would be viewed as um, insulting, or at least disrespectful, or at least you're not fulfilling your obligation because if I give a salam, you have to say walaikum salam. Right? That's expectation. In this culture in the West. If someone shakes their, puts their hand out to you, and generally they're not your enemy, and you know, and they know you're not their, you're not your enemy, and they just say, "Oh, pleased to meet you," and you don't shake their hands, and you just keep your hand like this, it's used as insulting. Why? Because there's an expectation that when they give a greeting, you have to give a reciprocal greeting back, right? which which involves the shaking of the hand. But the thing is this: um, after Muslims were um, colonialized, and colonization around the world was just really the West's method of spreading its culture and worldview all around the world to make clones, mini clones of itself in different countries. We started to use, to view religion and culture to be two different things. Um, now, there is, there is a distinction in the Arabic uh, used by many sociologists and people and thinkers in the, in the Muslim world um, between or objects which are universal and objects which are related to culture, which is objects which are universal are called madaniya, which comes from the linguistic kind of meaning pertaining to the city, like Medina, right? So it's things which are pertaining to a city, because city was a, was a industrial base. You, if you're a Bedouin, you don't really make you know, your metal implements and tools, you don't really tan leather, well maybe you could, but if you want to get the, the real professional stuff, you go to the city, where they have dedicated workshops and production lines that makes uh, high quality metal in implements and also high quality leather. You go to the city and so objects or technological objects are that which pertains to the city, Madaniya. Urban Not urbanization. Sorry? Urbanization. Yeah, urbanization, but yeah, but from Medina meaning the city. And of course, co objects which pertain to culture is called Bukhafa. Right, objects which are cultural objects. So, for example, you could, as a Muslim, you can uh, own a car, or as a Muslim, you can have a vase in your house on your mantelpiece if you want. But as a Muslim, uh, you can't have an idol of Ganesha 
on your, on your mantelpiece because that would be uh, contrary to your worldview to own such an object and to uh, put it in a position of veneration in your house. Right? So that is an object related to Tukhafa. So in Islam and certainly in the Arabic language and certainly in all other civilizations prior to secularization, they didn't see a difference between culture and what you call religion. They would see it as one and the same thing. Look at how Hindus described, but well, they didn't call themselves Hindus before, but before um, colonialism, uh, but how they described their religion, they called it Dharma. Dharma means law or their pathway. What about um, Japanese Shinto? Shinto means their way, means way. And every, uh, the Torah, which is uh, the Jewish book, means law, also a similar in Arabic language. Torah means law as well. They didn't say, oh, this is our religious book, and then we have culture, and we have laws and things. No, this was your deen. If you have a way of life, and you have practices and so on related to all these things, this is your deen. There's only one thing that, that um, a deen would be, would be kind of independent or semi-dependent semi from a deen, which is, it doesn't matter what language you follow, what language you use. So as a Muslim, you can speak Arabic, you can speak Urdu, you can speak Turkish, you can speak Persian. Different languages mean you follow a different deen. You can eat biryanis or kebabs or burgers. doesn't change your deen. You can have, if you're, uh, if you're Muslim, if you're Muslim male and you cover your aura using kind of like jumpers and hoodies and things like that, uh, and uh, it, uh, baggy pants or whatever you, you kind of wear in Canada, uh, that is acceptable and doesn't mean you have a different deen just because your style of clothing that covers your aura is different. Whereas for sisters, if they cover their aura, their um, parts which are not meant to be exposed according to this Islamic worldview, uh, or they use hijabs, or they use um, turbans, which are turbans, for example, which was also used by um, Arab, uh, Arab women in the 7th, 8th, 9th centuries as well. They had a type of turban as well, not just the men, it's like a smaller version of a male turban, but it covered everything, went around the chin, and they wore uh, long robes, or you want to wear a type of uh, shawa kameez, like really baggy trousers and really uh, kind of a loose shirt that didn't that cover body shape. It doesn't matter the style of clothing, you'd be following the same deen. You'd still be following the same deen. You can have variation. You can have variation even within a country. It doesn't matter. No, no one would say you're following a different deen. But because we have um, separated out religion from culture, we created a kind of schizophrenia in our mindset. And this schizophrenia, schizophrenia in our mindset, or rather um, a multiple personality disorder to be technically correct, um, causes us to have conflicts. Causes us to have conflicts. Because if you say to a Muslim, let's say a Muslim doesn't want to marry their daughter or their son to someone of a different ethnic group. And you say, ah, oh, look, your religion, you know, you're choosing your culture over religion. You're still saying that, oh, this is your culture. Whereas if you're saying today, if you, re if you say to them, if you do that, then you are not, you are not upon the deen of Islam sounds much more serious and is much more accurate. Or that if you believe that your, your nation state is better than others, and, or that you can even have a nation state, this is not the deen of Islam. You're not upon the deen of Islam. You're not following the deen, you're following a different deen. That might look similar in some aspects, but a different deen altogether. Why? Because Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, forbade Muslims to have asabiyyah, which is um, pride or even um, loyalty to a separate group other than the Ummah. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, he who calls for Asabiyyah, he who fights for Asabiyyah, he who dies for Asabiyyah, he's not one of us. Not one of us. Not, basically, not one of the Muslims. It's quite serious, actually, if you think about it. Because um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't create you to be loyal to your own separate groups. I mean, sure, you can have identities. When I say identities, as in you can make it known that you're from a certain area, that's not a problem. Because it actually helps you to recognize people. If you know someone's from, let's say, let's take example, if you know someone's from Edmonton, it's in Canada, right? They might have slightly different kind of ways of thinking than someone who's a Torontonian. 
right? Or if someone's from, if you're in the United States, of course, someone's from Texas, they have a bit of a different culture from, or different uh, uh, mindset and tastes uh, from someone who's from New York, right? Quite different. So knowing where someone's from helps you to communicate better because you can then, you can then modify how you speak to that person so that they can understand you and that you, you, they, you can understand them and you can have that communication. That's why the first thing you ask for when you meet someone is, where are you from? Where are you from? What, even what part of the city are you from? Because you'll then use your knowledge of that part of the city, of that part of the country, of that part of the world, to then inform how you communicate better to that person so you can actually have a better connection with that person. So, if Muslims, Muslims view culture and religion to be different, you are already secularized. You have already made a separation. Whereas in Islam, there's only deen. And I know in English language, I mean, English language, religion, and culture, I mean, culture is a very broad term anyway in English language. And religion, religion uh, comes from the root word, people think it comes from the root word to bind in, from religio in Latin, which is the same, similar root as what the word aqidah means. And the reason why they, they, uh, they use this term is because if this word just means aqidah, Right? which is where the, the, the Latin root of this word comes from, and this one means practice, you can have a separate belief and do a separate practice. Whereas, as Muslims, we believe that your practices come from your beliefs, in essence. What you, now, you might sin, but if you sin and you're like happy, you don't care, you're happy about it, then people say you don't have your mark. If you sin, you can sin, as in, as in, you can sin without invalidating your belief as long as you know and you accept that it's a wrong thing to do and you shouldn't be doing it. But if you do it, like, happily, and I see no problem with it, then it's said that you don't even have a, a mustard seed of iman in your heart, of belief. Because all beliefs, all actions come from beliefs. So when you say faith is in the heart, uh, yeah, faith is in the heart and it manifests by actions. You know, was it no smoke without fire, right? So the actions are the smoke, and the faith is the fire. If you don't have any faith, then you won't have nothing good coming out of that in your actions. Anyway, so that's one of the fundamental problems that Muslims um, make, uh, make assumptions in. The other aspect that uh, kind of Muslims, uh, the problems that, that kind of arise, is that we have something called, I'm going to try to rub all this off. Well, I can write something else very okay, quickly. You've got to be efficient. Right, so, the, the other issue is, I would say, what do we mean by we say cultural Muslim and religious Muslim? Right, so you have a cultural Muslim, what people say, someone's a cultural Muslim, we use this term quite a lot, and we have religious Muslim. So, when people use these terms, what do you think cultural Muslim refers to, and what do you think religious Muslim refers to? Does anyone have an idea? Uh, brothers, please tell me what I'm doing for time, I'm not sure the... Uh, Three more minutes. Two more minutes. I'll take one, I'll just take one person. Anyone else want, want to venture the cultural Muslim religious Muslim? Secular Muslim? Secular Muslim? Because you make a play on it. It's a continue, it's a continuation of our uh, compartmentalization, right? So what you just mentioned right now, like before, prior to this, you said culture and our idea of having of culture and religion as separate is a continuation of, I guess, a colonized way of thinking. Okay. All right, I'm going to... Okay, so... You have uh, 
two, two ways of looking at motivations and understanding and practice. Okay? A cultural Muslim is someone who's motivated by, they say, I, live in, I was born, raised, and lived in a society that has a particular belief, culture, and practice. So I follow it because um, this, is what every, what, this is what people do. Everyone else is doing it, I'll do it too. Hence, they could be they're cultural. They follow it because that's what they were raised into, and they imitate everyone, and that's and that's what they do. And when you take them out, let's say a Muslim country, and we even though Muslim countries still have problems as well, on uh, Islamic aspects, but if you take them into the West and they uh, they uh, grow up here, they will begin imitating the West or Western culture and uh, traditions because they just imitate what their surroundings, whatever it is their surroundings, right? Motivation. A religious person will say. I, I'm Muslim because I believe it's the truth. But you think, okay, so there's a clear delineation. You should be, you should be this one and not that one. Well, yes, when it comes to motivations, but it doesn't always mean that this one can't be secular as well. Why is that? Because understanding and practice, in understanding and practice, the, cult, the, uh, the cultural Muslim looks at Islam like it's a checklist. It's like, all right, as a Muslim, just make sure I fast during Ramadan, I pray five times a day. Um, uh, if anyone asks me, I'll just say I'm a Muslim, uh, because that's what I was told to say I am. And so, yeah, fine, I'll just say I am a Muslim. Um, why not? And um, I, will, I will basically, in public, in public, especially in public, I will basically just follow Islam as a bunch of things that you have to sort out and you have to do. The religious Muslim can go two ways. A, a Muslim who understands Islam as an aqidah, a belief, with a set of spiritual practices, but nothing more, will, act, will actually be no different in practice to this person in terms of check, in terms of looking at Islam as a checklist. They just say, this is the truth, and God wants me to be a good person by doing this, this, and like uh, fasting, and maybe I should uh, have good adab and uh, good uh, behavior and manners. But the difference between a religious Muslim and a, a cultural Muslim is that, in this, if they were to view it in that manner, is that they also keep it in private. So they follow the checklist in private too. And of course, you'd say, well, this is like a monopoly, isn't it? A hypocrite, right? And the other one believes in it, and so he keeps the checklist. But they're still secular, right? People who say, right, I'm a good Muslim, and as Muslims, we should uh, perfect ourselves and not worry about the world, the dunya, even though the, the Quran says not to neglect your portion of the world and the dunya. These people might be, might be following Islam in public and private, but only part of Islam, the individual personal aspects of Islam. Whereas the other understanding, the other, so this is all part of this side, the other understanding is that they are ideological, as in they view Islam as a deen and mabda, which means as a principle behind it, not just a checklist. This, the ideological Muslim believes Islam because it's the truth, but then when he realizes that God exists, there's a creator. The creator made everything in this universe. All this, the suns, the, 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 the stars, uh, well, the, the suns of different, or stars of different, uh, obviously, because we see uh, solar systems, the planets, mountains, earth, humans, different creatures, even uh, microorganisms, everything was made by the creator. Why is that? Why was it made? What is? And then they want to know that they would, they would study the purpose, they read Revelation, they say that there's a purpose behind everything, and this purpose doesn't just affect me, but affects every living thing, and even inanimate objects have a purpose behind them. Even the rocks and the stones and everything, everything has a purpose. So now, what do I, and society, and the world, and all things, what, how are we meant to fulfill this purpose? What should I do? 
to fulfill this purpose. That's an ideological Muslim. An ideological Muslim is proactive. An ideological Muslim, ideological Muslim tries to improve, tries to uh, look at the world through the objective of how do I achieve the purpose of creation that we were all made for. The religious Muslim who just understand Islam in a secular way, just use it as a set of checklist of things. So you live your life, yeah, you get married, and you try and have a good job, and you try to have kids, and then you die. And while you're doing that, just make sure that you don't like, lie, and you don't uh, fast if you, as much as you can, and you pray as much as you can. That's all. While you're doing that, just make sure that you don't break some rules. That's what the checklist Muslim, how it views it. And that's how many Muslims understand Islam as a checklist. Where the ideological Muslim says, how do we transform this world to attain the purpose of God? The purpose of God is made for us. What do I do? What do I campaign? How do I, you know, what technology should we, should we look at? What studies should we do? On like in astronomy and in biology and chemistry and mathematics and what things can we do to better improve and get closer to make to the ideal that was intended behind our creation. That's an ideological Muslim. So when he's talking about culture versus Islam, to finish up, it's not one where there are two competing forces. And that we, we have to have both, but they're fighting each other. No. Because the only thing that, you would, that we would allow that's culture is, within Islamic limits of course, the food you eat. And I don't think eating biryani or eating kebab or burger is a conflict between you and your imam. Right? Unless you, have, unless you like, are extremely obese and, and the doctors have said that it's going to kill you and then the sheikh has said it's going to kill you and it's haram for you. <laughs> then it's then. But normally, any of these foods, there's no, there's no, there's no clash between you and your imam. Or should I get a vase, or should I get um, a lamp, or should I get whatever? These are like universal objects. They don't clash between your iman and, and, uh, and so on, your, your way of life. But the reality of the world today, the clash is between different deeds. And in this case, even though a person might be called a religious Muslim, there is a clash between the secular understanding of Islam as a checklist and ideological Islam, deen wa a, a, a way of life based on a principle that, uh, an ideal. And that's really the clash, not Islam versus culture, but the clash between two deens, the deens of Islam, deen of Islam, and the post-colonial kind of deen that it was given to Muslims and taught to Muslims. And, and unfortunately, they don't know any better. I'm not saying, and we shouldn't say that they're not, uh, they're not uh, Muslim, because uh, most Muslims don't know any better. We, can, we were born into this world, that was thrust upon us, we don't know anyone any better, and so this is the situation. But there's no, there is no clash, there is only uh, one deen, and we should tell Muslims that they must follow this one deen, and not follow all the deeds, and only make their uh, obedience, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to nothing else. So, uh, since we do have to rush to Waterloo, we can take maybe two questions only, and the answer would be restricted to 60 seconds long. <laughs> We're going to take two questions. Who wants to go first? We'll, take, we'll, do, we'll give them a chance for the UTM students first, and then we'll go with Brother Bilal after. Anybody wants to, any questions? Okay, go ahead, Ahi. Um, so, my question is, uh, in what way can Urf affect Mutagayarat in their Istihbab or Karahiyya, and where do we draw the line between that and the Shahab al Okay, this is also the question, you want to take it? Um, you can comment when I can quick comment. One minute? <laughs> Less than one minute because the time is running. Okay. I'll take that one if you want. Uh, you can do it in one minute, you think? Yeah, I can do it in one minute. Okay. So basically, from an Usuli perspective, okay, the Aruf basically sets the Maqadir, and the, uh, 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 the Maqadir is basically the measurements of the Ahkam. So the Aruf, the Aruf never ever changes the Hukum. The Hukum Sharia is based upon the Nas. The Nas is basically what generates the Karaha, which is the disliking. Or the istihbab, uh, 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 which is uh, uh, a sunnah or recommended, or wujub or hurma, which is basically haram and obligation. So, in terms of the hukum, it stays the same. But for example, the, yani the, the mahar. Mahar is, 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 a, is, is it's a cornerstone within the contract for marriage, right? Let's say a brother and a sister you know, uh, verbally kind of agreed upon a mahar, and then there was a, a disagreement. 
what happens? If neither parties can actually prove their point, they'll go to the judge. The judge will use al-urf, which is the customs and traditions in society for the average mahr given for those people based upon maybe, let's say, their class or their uh, uh, wealth and so forth, and they will assign something. So the urf affects only the maqadir, the measurements that are uh, supposed to be uh, implemented by the hukum shari, which is only and only gets extracted from the nas shari. That's from an usuli perspective. And when, where do we draw the line, sorry, between we that will, and the Just because of time? Yeah, sorry. We will discuss the, where we draw the line maybe later, inshallah. We'll take uh, a brother over here. Yeah, so just a quick comment. Uh, that was a very good presentation. I just want to uh, just comment is that uh, I think, uh, and I, I don't like the word, I never liked the word religious Muslim or cultural Muslim. And I think when we're posed with that question, we shouldn't say, oh, do you consider yourself like cultural Muslim or religious Muslim? We should say, no, I, 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 I uh, uh, you know, I buy by a way of life, a certain way of life. And, uh, you know, I can tell you more about it. Is that a question so, or a comment? The, no, it was just a comment. <laughs> okay, exactly. The, 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 the ideological... We will not, we will not comment yeah. for that yeah. comment. <laughs> May Allah bless you, barakallahu yeah. alaykum, barakallahu alaykum. I don't think he meant otherwise, basically, Muslim is a Muslim. So, any, one more question just before we leave, because we, leave, we have to go. Sister? I have a question. Um, so, sister is asking if, um, if the parents are consistent that they don't want to marry and they want to <laughs> Again, I don't think that's going to be, it's going to be more than a, a minute and plus there might be specific circumstances that you, if I give a general answer, yeah. it would cause trouble for that person Correct. knowing all the different details and facts. But suffice to say, if we lived in an, an ideal situation, let's say in a, in, if a, if a, in a Khilafah for example, the Imam is the Wali for those who don't have one, right? and, and if someone falls foul of of uh, going outside Islam in their conditions and saying, like, I don't want you to marry this person because uh, for Jahiliya reasons, then uh, it should usually be able to go to the local Qadi representing the Imam or the Caliph, and the Caliph would, using his representative, marry off her to the person that she wants to marry. But the problem is that the parents would probably um, cut her off. If we, uh, I, I give, uh, this was asked yesterday, I'll be very quick. Um, what we can do as a, as a society, as a Muslim community is, and I was, people, well, people didn't say I was very harsh, but I felt very harsh saying it, is that uh, we should go to our mosques and we should uh, you know, tell them in there in their, as, for their khutbah, uh, as well as have a, a campaign amongst us that we need to shame people who I exhibit jahiliya. If they exhibit jahiliya, they should be publicly shamed in the community because many people, many parents make decisions based on what other people think. So they make everyone agree that anyone who, who uh, acts on jahiliya should be shamed by their community until they comply with, the, with Islam. If, if what they're worried about is what people think, then target that. So that's a practical thing. But as to her, her situation, I couldn't possibly comment because I don't know it in particular, and, um, nor would I dare to anything. But, but I guess I'll just add one more thing. Basically, if there is a rape situation, you should basically get counseling from the massage and the imams. Uh, you can basically uh, give her my contact if she wants to. And the proper way of dealing with this, actually on a practical level, is basically to speak to the parents and try to basically uh, gather the parties together and, 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 and bridge the gap. Uh, that's the first step that we would take, explain to the parents basically the rules of Islam and the, the consequences that could basically happen due to this and so forth. And may Allah SWT basically make their hearts, uh, inshallah, lenient and, 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 and give them a change of heart. But also we need to understand basically who this person is, uh, who this girl is trying to marry, and does he really fit basically the, the akhlaq and deen basically category that Islam basically would, would uh, uh, promote? Because at the end of the day, as I said, there might be, might be, but it's not definite, but there might be a leeway basically where a judge or a person who basically represents a judge in, in uh, today's case, which is the Imam of the Masajid, who is knowledgeable in the Sharia, not any, any Imam, to be honest. You know, there's the Imams who lead the Salah, and there's the Imam who is a Faqih. So the Imam al Faqih basically will play the role of the Qadi, who is actually missing in today's, uh, uh, in this society. Uh, for uh, for known reasons, so we will try to basically figure things out based upon the hukum shari in that case. So if there's a real case, let her inshallah either contact one of the imams that she trusts, or you can basically uh, give her my contact inshallah, and we'll deal basically with this in a real uh, and, and practical situation. Barakallahu feekum, jazakum Allah khair, may Allah bless you.